My name is Colin Coates. I'm the former director of the Robards Centre. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Shilpa Bhatt today, who will be speaking on the work of M.G. Vasanji. This is Dr. Bhatt's second visit to Toronto. She was here as a Commonwealth Scholar at the University of Toronto a few years ago. She's a specialist in diasporic literature, teaches at Ahmedabad University, and in particular is able to come here to work on uh, M.G. Vasanji and to work in his papers, which are held in the archives here at York University. Dr. Bhatt, your talk will be on hacking hypocrisy, fending off uh, foreignness in the age of globalization and narratives of M.G. Vasanji. Today I'll be talking about the notion of uh, hybridity in the context of Vasanji's narratives. And as we all know, he has emerged as a very prolific writer in Canada in present times. And Canada very frequently becomes a textual stage in his narratives. And Jonathan Rollins, you know, very interestingly says that for him, displaced narratives are performed and witnessed according to the logic of uh, Benedict Anderson's imagined communities. So according to this line of reasoning, he says, Canada becomes not only a literary, but also a literal home for Basenji. And you see, Vasanji himself said in one context that his work would have been an orphan if he had not had the support of Canada and the Canadian readers, which I think is a very, very strong statement uh, for a writer to, to make. And I'll be examining some of his books with reference to the theory of hybrid, hybridization uh, in my seminar presentation today. Wherever there is encounter of cultures, there is invariably a talk of hybridization. And in this age of globalization, the perception is that uh, most cultures, because they come under the effect of globalization, get hybridized, they get mixed up. It is perceived to be normal, predictable, foreseeable. It's a regular feature. It is believed to be anticipated. It is anticipated. And an overriding question, the four, um, that has been asked by researchers and critics is that doesn't hybridity imply that what precedes it is purity? As we say, hybridization is mixing up of cultures, this and that. So what precedes it? Is it purity? Well, uh, let's take a, a look at one of the definitions of hybridity. And it's quite literal, but let's bear with it, because we come from the Department of Humanities. For us, hybridization could mean so many different things, because we come from different disciplines. We come from the Department of History, Political Science, Literature, and Language. So hybridization could mean different things to uh, many of us. The Latin roots of the word are revealed as referring to the progeny of a tame sow and a wild boar. Is this old usage relevant to the diversity of cultural hybridities claimed today. In the sciences of agriculture and horticulture, hybridity is used with a little alarm. The best known hybrid being the mule, a mixture of a horse and donkey, though significantly this is a sterile or non-productive mix. In the world of plants, hybrid combinations are made by grafting one plant or fruit to another. Although in this field such grafting may seem legitimate, only a mildly imprudent jump is needed to move from notions of horticulture and biology to discussions of human races as distinct species that, upon mixing, produce hybrids. Now this definition is rooted in the metaphors of biology, very specifically botany and zoology, but the metaphors that people from the Department of Humanities use is are rooted in the metaphors of culture. And my paper investigates this idea of hybridization that has been a subject intense, of intense examination and debate among critics and researchers. And to comprehend it better, I have chosen the terrain of diaspora and to further understand the relationship uh, between diaspora and hybridity, I have chosen the narratives of M.G. Vasanji, who writes about East Africa and India from Canada in Canada. Looking across his Uber, one of the first things we find uh, is the migratory wing crossing countries from India to East Africa to Canada, raising questions of diffusing boundaries. 
Second, the conjuring up of the imaginative Shamsi community, it's a religious community, in most of his works, and endorsing syncretic recreation of Hindu and Islam religions, reinforces the idea of mixture for coherence and unity. Yet we may note that despite hybridization, the components of the two religions are clearly discernible. The choice of M.G. Masinji for my research is not arbitrary. Uh, first, he's a writer who, whose ancestors hail from Gujarat, the place that I'm presently residing in, and whose business history uh, commonly trails to Africa from where they were later expelled to different parts of the globe, as we know, including Canada. Second, Wasinji happens to persistently refer to Canada as a critical point where he precipitates his literary interests and where diversity of cultures is celebrated through ideas of multiculturalism and uh, the mosaic. His works straddle nations, histories of those nations, cultures of several countries, including those that are not technically his home, cartographies, music, cuisines of all the places that he visits. Third and most important, there is in his works an automatic and insistent heterogenizing and hybridizing gaze that assumes that cultural landscapes are perpetually reshaped and a constant state of amalgamation. And this refrain of hybridity is so insistent that one wonders, as Kapchan and Strong mention, if the analysts of culture like us are destined to simply accumulate examples of hybridization. Several post-colonial critics seem to perceive hybridity as anything that is a consequence of intermingling of two or more elements that are in resistance with each other, yet manage to somewhere commingle completely. Mary Louis Pratt, as we all know, refers to this as contact zone. That's the term that she uses to indicate the space where socio-cultural elements collide. The people belonging to the Shamsi community in Wasinji's narratives interact with people with identities outside their society. But the moment, let's note, the moment that there is, there seems to be a gesture at mixture, there is disarray. There is this constant effort to stave off fusion. The various stratifying forces make sure that hybridization becomes difficult and challenging. As David Mount notes, ambivalence reinforces the separation the socio-cultural borders are fluid. But then, though there is interface between people of various ethnicities and identities, hybridization doesn't take place easily, or the process of hybridization is of so slow becoming, slow becoming within quotes, because it's not my term, that it goes unnoticeable. In the Book of Secrets, for example, Vasanji refers to various ethnicities emerging from India located in Africa. He says, I quote, roughly half the Indians belong to the Shamsi sect of Islam and have a separate mosque. There are also Hindu, Punjabi and Maimon families, but quite often the distinction blurs. Quite often the distinction blurs. Unquote. Now this statement is contradictory. Let's analyze this. On one hand, he talks about the distinctions that blur suggesting contact zone of Louis Pratt. And then there's the clear spelling out of the identities of the people. You have a Hindu, you have a Punjabi, you have Bemen families. He says they mix up and then he spells out the components. So is this eradication of distinctions or marking of distinctions? Is he confused? Let's analyze further. In a similar way, David Mount talks about the hybridizing of the elements from, I quote, beliefs derived from Quran and the local African beliefs, two things. He says they're all mixed up. But the question is, on one hand, Mount clearly pronounces and names the ethnic forces. He names them, says they are, this comes from India and this comes from Africa and so on. And he names the ethnic forces that are seemingly hybridizing and on the other claims that those forces have mixed. So hybridization implies that resulting mixture undergoes transformation so that it is quite unrecognizable, but this doesn't happen in most of these instances. 
Therefore, there is the necessity to ponder over if there is an indiscriminate use of the term hybridity. Is the rhetoric of hybridity an illusion? It is this space that becomes the present for hybridization. But to use the term with such felicity as to suggest mere mixing up of two or more strange and wondrous cultural elements is, is problematic. Again, today it's a matter of consensus that there is no culture that is not hybrid, which means hybridity is believed to be a very usual and normal condition. Nonetheless, we have to admit that hybridity has always been treated as a special case. The reason behind this, as we all can clearly see, are the veritable distinctions that prevail in cultures. When we experience culture in a specific region where it is handed down from one generation to another, we see it as authentic culture, perhaps and therefore pure without realizing that all cultures at all times are constantly attacked by fresh socio-cultural, political, historical forces. Therefore, it is the historical and cultural abstractions from comparative perspectives that endow hybridity, the quality that it is. Now, Vasanji's writings can be read under the rubric of migrant literature, which deals with uh, individual, diasporic, national and globalized identities. And current research studies on the process of hybridization reveal that hybridity exists in various degrees since cultures cannot mingle predictably and in 50-50 ratio, right? A major characteristic of migrant literature is that the central protagonist is seen as an individual with superior qualities of perception, an individual who has a profound vision. And he is offered as a contrast to the sedentary citizen who is rooted, static, and constant. The perception is that it's always the transplanted, transnite national migrant who sees, who actually sees, evaluates, and records history, politics, and culture. And in contrast, the rooted and stable, stable individuals belonging to a nation just happen to play out their roles. Sten Mosland, in his book, Migration, Literature, and Hybridity, discusses the ideas of difference, difference with a capital D, sameness, sameness with a capital S, fast and slow beginnings. Difference, sameness, fast and slow becomings with reference to Deleuze and Guattari's concept of the rhizome and root networks. He goes on to analyze in depth the concept of hybridity with reference to three novels, Bharti Mukherjee's Jasmine, Jamal Mehjoub's uh, The Carrier, where the, the telescope is the dominating trope, and V.S. Naipaul's The Enigma of Arrival. He discusses in great detail, detail about how hybridity exists in all migrant literature, albeit in a variety of forms, and he terms them as organic and intentional hybridity. He defines organic hybridity as, I quote, the unconscious processes by which difference is incorporated into a culture which causes it to change slowly over long stretches of time as the incorporation of foreign words into a language. Indian English is believed to be a very good example for organic hybridization. Intentional hybridity, on the other hand, is a highly conscious form of hybridity, a conscious highlighting of or affirmation of hybridity, whereas Organic hybridity is slow speed. It follows that intentional hybridity is at least intended as proposing a high speed is epistemological and ontological transformation. Now, this interpretation is helpful in comprehending the multifarious layers and degrees of hybridization that I was talking about. And in Vasanji's works, if these nuanced theories of hybridization are to be applied, there is an outstanding registering of difference verbalized in high velocity, intensity, and frequency. Hybridization is seen taken for granted. It is seen as natural, inherent, automatic part of the colonized diasporic population. The use of English language, as I just mentioned, for instance, is frequently interspersed in his narratives with African and Gujarati words. And here it is worth noting that to Bakhtin, the heteroglot novel produces what he refers to as a dialogized, multi-languaged, or polyglot consciousness. In Vasanji's narratives, difference in terms of language and culture are, are clearly palpable. 
we know that when it is a Swahili word, it comes from Swahili language and from Africa. And when it is a Gujarati word, it is Gujarati language. We can, we can discern the components, yet we call this hybridization. But we are able to identify these words coming from diverse cultures. Let's, let's remember this. It's the use of different languages that evokes foreignness in the narratives, thereby issuing forth differences. And this registering of differences in terms of actual writing happen in Canada by the writer. The moment we translate the foreign words in the language that we understand, we begin moving from difference to sameness. In the meanwhile, slowing down the process of difference becoming or taming the difference in the semiotic sphere of the narratives. And the idea of hybridity becomes very complex with the concept of multiculturalism that is inevitable due to the effects of globalization. Hybridization happens even if I'm rooted to one place. And that is why I said sedentary citizen within inverted commas. Admixture happens even if I choose not to move. Even if I refuse to move, the world around me moves bombarding at me images, dreams, metaphors of sundry cultures. And this idea is particularly true in the context of Canada, where you have people coming from different parts of the globe and from diverse cultures. The concept of hybridity, therefore, is indeterminate because the implication is never on singularity but on multiplicity. Its connotations relate to multifarious layers the consequence of such flourishing use of the term hybridization is almost of misuse, overuse, or even abuse. For want of a better term for hybridization, anything that implies even the remotest of hybridization is, is categorically and guiltlessly termed hybridization. So we, what we find in the theory is the use of prefixes like organic hybridity, Intentional hybridity, aesthetic hybridity, because somewhere we know that it's not really equal to, to the definition of hybridization. And we are able to discern the various disparate components clearly. Uh, this so very clearly implicates a challenge because for want of better terms, there is an attaching of terms with the concept. This looking for alternatives for improved terminology has become a necessary phenomenon in order to aid better understanding of the complexities associated with the with globalization and identity. Now, migratory patterns have brought about sweeping changes in the demographies, epistemologies, histories, and politics of the world. And these changes are defined and redefined in the framework of hybridity under various labels and with several prefixes, as I just mentioned. The repercussions of this process are a strategic reconstruction of identities in transnational spaces and ancestral geographies, especially in Vasanji's narratives. Yet, the, the reality is that the current debates on the matter gesture at ambivalence. Fred Waugh expatiates on the, the ceaseless significations of the hyphen debate that can be a potential site for hybridity suggestions. He, he talks about the, the hyphen and he says, this henopoetic punct, this flag of the many in one, yet less than one and double. He's talking about the hyphen, let's remember that, is the operable tool that both compounds difference and underlines sameness, so contradictory. Though the hyphen is in the middle, it's not in the center. It's a property marker, a boundary post, a borderland, a railroad, a last spike, a stain, a cipher, a rope, a knot, a chain, a foreign word, a warning sign, a head tax, a bridge, a no man's land, a nomadic, floating magic puppet. Now you see it, now you don't. The hyphen is the hybrid's dish. The mestizas, old wheat tortillas. The metis's apple, red on the outside, white on the inside. The hapa's egg, white out, yellow in. These metaphoric associations cull from objects, cuisines, food, property, borders, magic, underline not only the complexities, but also the notoriousness, the associated threats, and the inevitability of the hybrid theory. One wonders if there is any object that I mentioned 
uh, from his definition that is not hybrid. Perhaps it encompasses all because such is the reality of the concept. Hybrid, and, and then Martin Gersh's statement is helpful to the understanding of this rather complex term. He says, hybridity is a heterogeneous concept. In its syncretistic sense, it foregrounds a mixing of diverse cultural influences to a more or less homogeneous new whole. Recent arguments have stressed the dynamics of hybridity as a process that is infinitely creative. And this is particularly useful in, in the idea of, of cultural productions like music, films, and literature, because we believe that hybridization allows this, this quality of newness, innovativeness, and freshness to these uh, cultural texts. And that's how they become popular. And for instance, in India, uh, during the 1990s, uh, What's that? Um, film music began to be mixed with, with Western music, and people started liking it. <laughs> so that's a very good example of, of intentional hybridity because that, that took place at great velocity, very high speed. Critics like Robert Young, Sten Mosland analyze Baba and Bhakta's views on the theory and claim that intentional hybridity, as evidenced in transcultural migrant literature, has a function in narratives, implying that it's a dynamic force with regards to the issues and their narration. And the discourse of intentional hybridity can be politically neutral and disinterested. Now here what is interesting is the establishment of the fact that intentional hybridity is an intentionally oppositional discourse. Now Vasanji represents his perspectives in his narratives as a third person, as one who objectively views and comments on the historical events. He's neither criticizing nor critiquing, nor elucidating a political agenda. And he does all this from the vantage point of, of Canada. He's neither anti-colonial nor post-colonial, but politically neutral, yet participating in the discourse of hybridity through consistently releasing differences with great velocity in his narrative discourse. Baba states that the aim of cultural difference is to re-articulate the sum of knowledge from the perspective of the signifying position of the minority that resists totalization. Now, resistance of totalization in the context of Vasanji's narratives can be applied to the homogeneity, to the idea of homogeneity that is clearly in the peripheries of marginality in his narratives because he, he has this insistent hybridization, hybridizing gaze. Both heterogeneity and velocity are foregrounded in intentional hybridity and repetitively inundated with differences in culture, race, history, politics. In other words, intentional hybridity has the capacity of profusely releasing differences in representations of sameness and discourses of homogeneity. Through frequent historical references, Vasanji's hybridizing gaze connects, reconnects, and constantly tries to foreground indigenous, Asian, African, British and Canadian cultures, the Canadian uh, connection appearing either at the beginning when the double divisional protagonist revisits his home country or at the end when the Indian diaspora in Africa are expelled by the Ugandan Idi Amin. The transition of the Indian diaspora happens across the colonial era in, in Africa followed by the expelling of the Asians from the continent to their arrival in Canada as refugees. Now this historical strain echoes in most of his books or remains as a strong undercurrent in his works in varying degrees. In The Magic of Saida, this undercurrent is conspicuous with the protagonist as a witness to various historical, political, and cultural frictions and such episodes as the Maji Maji Rebellion in 1905, the Battle of the Bees or the Battle of Tanga in, in Tanzania in 1914 and so on. The African nation becomes a ground for German and British colonizing forces. In contrast, the Asians have always been there, and their recognition as Asians coming from India is just incidental. Now, in all these contexts in the narratives, traveling almost a century, is the encapsulation of societies that are perceived as fundamentally hybrid in all forms, right from miscegenation to creolization. In the novels, The Book of Secrets and The Gunny Sack, the object in the title becomes the centrifugal force and scattering the hybridizing forces across the nation. In all his fictional representations, it is the Asians embedded in the African society since Yore. And history is inscribed in a manner to suggest the immemoriality of the hybridized past. So much so that it's never the superimposition of Indian, particularly Gujarati, or onto the African terrain. The two races and the two cultures do not have decotomating tendencies, 
but both cohabit together in a mutually acknowledged, supposedly inherently qualified hybridized society. Therefore, the book and the gunny sack become the nucleus which circulate the hybridizing forces. Taking a cue from this, an outstanding feature of all literature is the assumption of unavoidable mixture of two or more races and cultures. There is no work of art that is pure and pristine. Edward Said said in his, in his essay, Reflections on Exile. You see, in that essay, he refers to Simone Weil, who stated that to be rooted is perhaps the most important and least recognized need of the human soul. Through understatement, this perspective shows showers and comiums on status, stasis and, and homogeneity, which is in stark contrast to celebratory readings of migrant narratives by critics. And in the same essay, Syed says that borders and barriers which enclose us within the safety of familiar territory can also become prisons and are often defended beyond reason or necessity. Both these statements in the same essay are oppositional. While one celebrates home, the other undermines it. And Syed's idea of home becoming a confinement clearly indicates the modern day proclivities to the idea of globalization. We all want to see what's happening. We want to see how the energies in different countries and cultures are, are circulating and so on. Now in my observations throughout uh, my presentation, I have been using the term hybridity. Nonetheless, I'm categorically citing instances of cultural recognition of rituals, customs, images, objects, and ambition represented as distinct, separate, and, and derived from diversity. Despite constant reference to diversity in culture, however, Vasanji portrays colonial oppression as something that he himself um, you know, experienced, that he saw during his childhood, and the lament that he and Asian residents are not identified with the history of, of Africa when they are expelled by the Ugandan Idi Amin. And it becomes a, an attempt to flatten out all differences into homogeneity. And the political event, as we see, is totally opposed to hybridizing forces and persistently attempts to fend off hybridization and differences. Now, the characters that migrate from one sphere to, of culture to another assume to have become receptacles of culture in which, which hybridization has taken place. They eventually migrate and settle in Canada, insinuating that, that hybridization has reached its zenith and culmination here. And this pattern recurs in his works, making Canada the destination for infinite and multiple hybridities. But even here, the cultural aspects and the migrant characters are clearly recognizable. In the Book of Secrets, search for the continuation of the colonial stories of the book moves uh, outside Africa to UK and Canada. Again, the quest for understanding culture and hybridization happens in countries external to the place assumed to be the locus of hybridizing forces. The point is, there are references to two or more foreign cultures written in a foreign land, but these elements are not hybridized, but seem to exist side by side as distinct entities. To term the supposed mixture of cultures as hybridization can be oversimplification of the term. However, to call it coexistence of cultures might lead to aporia. While all writers and critics talk about why hybridization takes place, there are hardly any who talk about why hybridization doesn't take place. Because we assume that it's a natural process, has always happened, is happening, and will continue to happen, as if there's no respite from the fusing forces in the age of globalization. However, on closer analysis, we find that in Vasanji's narratives, the cultural codes are distinctly discernible. The point is, how is that, or how can cultural mores remain unhybridized and clearly recognizable even after a long period of time? Does culture or certain components of culture remain static, inert for a duration, or temporarily or inter intermittently? Perhaps not. And it is precisely this aporia that I have sought to examine in, in my paper. Now, in the light of these views, I contend that there is a clear attempt to fend off foreignness in the event of impending hybridization. If we, for a moment, perceive the process as coexistence, it comprises jostling and nudging forces that do not allow mixture to happen, at least not in high velocity, like the leaves of a lotus which fend off water. It is precisely fending off that happens in the case of lack of hybridization or in instances of slow becomings. I'm using the prototype of, of high-level water repellents of the lotus leaf to understand the degree with which the cultures mix. 
I shall call this the lotus effect to imply that very often than not we presume that cultures meet, cultures clash, but instead of hybridization what happens is cultural components sit together so closely that their point of convention is potentially blurred. At this point we perceive as hybridization. And the narratives of Masanji are replete with instances of miscegenation of Indians and Africans. An insistent, an insistent question of course here would be how can hybridization be perceived in this context, in the context of miscegenation? Because I'm, I'm sure people will say that miscegenation, you have an offspring who is clearly unrecognizable, and there you cannot you know, point out who is who, right? And in the magic of Saida, the protagonist, the protagonist is a Chotara. Chotara in Swahili language is a half caste, implying miscegenation. Iqbal Arthur's incisive research study on the Khoja caste from Gujarat in East Africa refers to a legal case uh, that took place in the last part of 19th century, a real, actual, legal case. It refers to the case of Hurbai, who did not want her stepson, Nazur Jeza, to inherit the property of his father because of his half-caste Chotara status. And referring to, to the history of Koja community in East Africa, Akhtar states, many Koja men had partners who were concubines, the, the Indians who, who traveled and settled in East Africa. See, they used female slaves. And in 1870, the Koja caste numbered 718 males, 642 women. So, so there is a difference. Uh, uh, there's, a, there's a lack of proportion there and 540 children. It appears that the initial paucity of Koja women had been filled in the intervening decades through emigration. Within this new demographic reality, the status of Chotara or half-caste children born to non-Koja mothers began to be renegotiated as culturally unacceptable. This kind of renegotiation of identities, of phenotypes and attitudes of miscegenation happens to be the fending off of the hybridization processes by marginalizing the Chotara from, from inheriting property and not accepting the individual into the Koja cultural mainstream. Kurbai argued that Koja custom following Hindu caste traditions does not allow Chotara children to inherit property, citing the belief from the Koja oral tradition that from our perspective, there exists no equality between a Koja and a non-Koja Chotara. So he, we find an instance of fending off foreignness, miscegenation is not accepted. Now this very accept, act of attempting to exclude miscegenation both through societal pressure and legally clearly indicates the tendency of intense oppositional forces existing both before and after hybridization. This fending off of hybridization in this specific case of miscegenation becomes very intense. In terms of marriage also, there was similar effort to discourage interracial marriages and Akhtar made mentions. This spirit was formative in articulating the Ismaili identity and racial boundaries of the Aga Khani Koja community as exclusively Indic in form. Among the first farmans he issued to his followers was to seize African multiracial relations. Do not take a goli home as a wife. In Kachi and Katiawani language from Gujarat, Goli literally means a female slave. So do not take a female slave from Africa at home. So from all perspectives and all directions, mixture was not endorsed. Kurbai's case portrays fending off foreign case as a case in miscegenation. It is revulsion towards a hybridized offspring. Now, in a similar instance, with reference to Vasanji's writings, when Idi Amin pronounced the expulsion of Asians, what he was doing was up, uh, identifying, upholding, and identifying this meeting point of cultures to fend off the diffusing quality of the so-called hybridization process. Nonetheless, in spite of the lotus effect of water repulsion, to completely vaporize water droplets seems near impossibility, and this we recognize as the process of globalization. In this context, I would like to mention that with the politics of expulsion of Asians from Africa, they migrated and settled in Western Europe and, and Canada. You know, that is how they dispersed and went to different parts of the world. Vasanji creates a dialectics between the nomadic and the static gaze through his high-speed, intentionally hybridizing vision. A criticism of migratory literature is that 
the migrant protagonist is lionized and celebrated for being more sagacious, mature, and even omniscient in contrast to the sedentary citizen, if there's something called sedentary. This suggestion is endorsed by Said too when he says, most people are principally aware of one culture, one setting, one home. Exiles are aware of at least two, and this plurality of vision gives rise to an awareness of simultaneous dimensions, an awareness to borrow a phrase from music is contrapuntal. We find this idea echoed by so many other critics. Andrew Smith calls this the double perspective. Salman Rushdie in Imaginary Homeland states, Indian writers from these islands are capable of writing from a kind of double perspective because they, we, are at one and the same time insiders and outsiders in this society. This stereoscopic vision is perhaps what we can offer in the place of whole sight. Yet, it is the self-same trap that Rushdie seems to talk about with regards to suggesting that uprootedness as opposed to fixity is what endows greater discernment to migrants. He talks about all the many elephant traps lying ahead of us. The largest and most dangerous pitfall would be the adoption of a ghetto mentality. The staunch belief that migrants are better Providing them a loftier status assumes the form of a ghetto mentality. Andre Asiman states that exiles say double, feel double, are double. And again, you know, putting them on a pedestal and giving them a loftier stature. Now, it is this idea of celebration of migrants in migratory literature that has been the target of critics like, like Mosland, who cautions us against such celebratory readings and theorizations. And the plurality of vision that Said talks is precisely the terrain of hybridity of, of cultural differences and cultural sameness that writers liberate in their narratives. But the question that I ask is whether this process of hybridization is actually hybrid or whether it is coexistence misperceived as, as hybridization. A recurring pattern in Masanji's fiction is the return of the protagonist to home and then noting the changes. Besides fiction, he does this in his memoirs, and home was Kariyaku, and uh, a place within rediscovering India. He goes back to the countries he lived in, or, or that he visited, and then records and analyzes the changes. And then there's the drawing of connections between cultures and places, and it is these sites that display contexts of hybridity. For instance, Vasanji talks about a hangout called Safari in Toronto, which offers East African food, and then you can hear uh, Indian Bollywood songs in the background. So to wind up my, my presentation, perhaps a healthier word to mean hybridity could be coexistence, implying that components of cultures don't mix up as if in a blender, but sit side by side, giving an illusion of hybridity. Now this deceptive innocence of hybridization is what we really need to fathom. The overuse of the term at times inadvertently attempts a subterfuge of coexistence when we actually find forces in opposition to, to one another. But then, differences exist naturally, and it is not wrong to preference, you know, practice those differences in society and culture. And that can be seen as the implication of the idea of the mosaic of cultures. Thank you.